Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Golden Eagle Audubon Society's uh, special December program. We really appreciate your uh, attendance here this evening. It's awesome to see uh, quite a robust um, interest in this topic, and, uh, and we're really glad to be able to bring this program to you. Uh, I'm Liz Paul. I'm the program coordinator for the Golden Eagle Audubon Society. And um, uh, this evening's program is being recorded and it will be um, posted onto the Golden Eagle Audubon YouTube page uh, tomorrow or maybe the next day. And so and it'll be available to, to the public. Anybody can, can watch it there. Um, excellent. We're expecting a lot of people tonight and we do um, uh, ask that everybody keep their video and their audio off for the duration of our program this evening. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce the Golden Eagle Audubon Society Executive Director, Cynthia Wallace, who is going to also welcome you here this evening. Good evening. Yes, thank you for coming. It's great to see so many folks joining for this adventurous topic. And um, yeah, thanks for being here. I'm really glad that we can have some Zoom meetings too, you know, as the weather is dark and dreary and the roads aren't too bad, but um, it's really nice to be able to go online like this. And and it seems like you like it too, because because there's a lot of you. So, um, so thanks for coming. Um, another big thing about December is it is the month of giving. And I assume that Golden Eagle Audubon is probably your favorite nonprofit, or at least your favorite one tonight, because here you all are. So um, for those of you that have answered our ask and did donate this year already in December, thank you so much. Really, we, we can't have programs like this without your support. So we really, really appreciate it. And if you have yet to donate, we can help you do that. And I'm gonna go ahead and put the link in the chat for you to click on. And you can also mail a check and I'll, I'll write our address in there as well. So um, yeah, if you, you'll be learning a little bit more about us, I'm sure. But um, yeah, we just really appreciate all your support and it helps us touch so many folks. So with that, I'll turn it back to Liz and uh, we'll get started. Thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. And uh, again, so this is Golden Eagle Audubon Society. We are a local nonprofit based in Southwest Idaho. Uh, 51 years, 51 years young, our great uh, organization. Um, so again, uh, this program is being recorded and will be available on the Golden Eagle Audubon YouTube channel. Uh, please keep your audio and your video off during the presentation this evening. Please communicate through the chat. We're happy to um, entertain questions. They'll be answered at the end uh, in the chat. But if you have other, if you have other um, issues, I can see there's something about people maybe having a hard time. Um, hearing. Uh, put those on there and we'll try to get to them um, as soon as we can and help you make sure you uh, can uh, fully enjoy this presentation. So we are very privileged this evening to have a very special guest, Saren Salvaggio, uh, coming to us from Portland, Oregon. Sharon works for the Xersa Society, an international nonprofit, more than 50 years old itself. They are, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but they are highly about insects. Let's put it that way. Um, and Sharon assists the staff and the partners at the Xerces Society and the public to reduce reliance on pesticides and to better understand pesticide risk to invertebrates. She per previously worked at the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides. She also worked at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and for the U.S. Forest Service. She um, so she's able to integrate her, her emphasis on pesticides with her experience actually out there in the field, natural resource management. She earned a Master of Science in Energy and Resources and a Bachelor of Arts in Biology, both from the University of California at Berkeley. And
and she's got a big vegetable garden teeming with teeming with insects, I bet, and um, and enjoys the outdoor life in the uh, Pacific Northwest. And we just can't be uh, be more pleased to present tonight uh, for this program, grasshoppers and Mormon crickets, valuable bird prey or virulent pests. Uh, very uh, interesting topic here. Uh, Sharon Salvaggio, I'm gonna turn it over to her and she's gonna uh, do her program. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you, Liz. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Well, hello everybody. I am uh, really happy to be here to talk to you today. Um, thank you, Liz, and thank you, Golden Eagle Audubon, for inviting me. And I understand my colleague Aaron was here talking to you last month. Some of you may have caught his presentation. I hope you found his presentation valuable as, um, about residential um, land management and how to avoid pesticides on new properties. So today, um, Liz already, you know, my title's there for you to read, and I recognize that this title may, may seem a bit provocative. And I really want to invite you to re-examine how we think about and discuss grasshoppers and related insects. Words like plague, calamity, and invasion are commonplace descriptors when people talk about grasshoppers or Mormon crickets. And I wanna just suggest that in using this everyday language, people might be missing something. And one thing that I think most people are missing is the important role of Western rangeland grasshoppers and women crickets as prey for other animals, especially birds. Before I dive in, um, a little background. Liz already talked a little bit about our organization. Um, and we were founded in 1971 by Robert Michael Pyle and named after this lovely little blue butterfly, the Xerxes butterfly, Xerxes blue butterfly which was actually driven extinct by human development. What we're all about is protecting the life that sustains us because we truly couldn't survive without the ecological services of invertebrates. Specifically, invertebrates are food for countless other animals. They provide pollination services. They provide decomposition and recycling of all matter that breaks down and ultimately gets recycled into new nutrients for growing things. They purify water and they provide natural pest control for free. So this slide shows just eight species, wildly diverse, sometimes incredibly beautiful and all playing one or more of these roles. Liz uh, talked about my background just a little bit. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I wanna say like most of you, I'm guessing I've been drawn to the natural world my whole life and so when I was in my 20s, I chose a career path as a biologist, hoping I could work outdoors. And I was lucky to be able to do that. I spent my early years with the Forest Service and got chances to survey songbirds, to survey amphibians, owls, and elk as part of my job. Even though the real work was getting the, the cutout, the timber sales that uh, were a big part of the West Side Forest in Oregon. And later I moved to the National Wildlife Refuge System and I spent 17 years there helping refuges develop long-term management plans. And I worked as a refuge manager overseeing our farming programs, native land restoration work, evaluating, pe evaluating pesticide proposals, which is really how I kind of got into this pesticide stuff and managing recreation. So this is a photo of me um, taking water quality samples on a refuge. Once I left the Fish and Wildlife Service, I joined the nonprofit world. And so I've been in the nonprofit world for about 10 years with my main focus being pesticides and pest management. So let's, let's turn our focus now to Orthoptera. And I, and I wanna show a few fun facts about this group of animals, which includes grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Now I'm gonna be using that word a few times in this presentation, so just remember that Orthoptera refers to this insect classification that includes those three uh, kinds of insects. Now, Orthoptera evolved and first appeared on the planet 350 million years ago. They appeared on the planet even before birds. And there's about 25,000 species worldwide. Most make sound, mainly to attract mates, but I think for other reasons as well. And guess what? 
each species has a song that's unique. And it's just like birds, but some are in the ultrasound spectrum too high for us to hear. So, and they pick up that sound, they listen to the fellows out there with the ears, quote unquote, that are located not on their heads, but on their abdomens or their legs. And they can jump. Do you remember the long jump from grade school? I bet most of us, I mean, I was no athlete in grade school. Maybe some of you were, <laughs> but humans just aren't really made to jump, um, you know, despite the people in the NBA. You know, maybe we could jump six, eight feet at that age, but a grasshopper can jump 20 times its own length. So this is really interesting because they don't just do that. They actually have the help of spring-like mechanisms in their joints. So they're really designed or um, they evolved, you know, with these particular capacities and the anatomy shows it. Um, another thing, Oh, and I just want to point out those big, beautiful legs in this, this photo up here of this arid land grasshopper. Now, across the world, we see orthoptera. They're common and dominant herbivores, especially in grassland ecosystems. And a few species cycle between a solitary phase and a gregarious phase. So the gregarious phase means that they kind of, they start to swarm in groups. This is the one that people worry about. And what's kind of interesting about this, there's distinct changes that often mark the two phases, both behaviorally and color changes. I, I just find this really interesting um, because even locusts, which we, I think we all have heard about through biblical association and everything, you know, they actually, it's almost, I mean, it's certainly a word that tags on to species names, but it's almost describing this swarming um, behavior in many species. So another interesting and strange thing is that some biologists believe that this phase change phenomenon from solitary to gregarious actually evolved independently in different parts of the world, which I just kind of blows my mind. So finally, you may notice why, you know, this bison photo and why you may be wondering why I have this bison photo on this, on this slide um, about grasshoppers. Well, Another thing that fascinates me is that prior to European settlement of the American West, we had a grasshopper species that was so numerous. It had an estimated biomass in North America approaching that of the American bison. I don't know if any of you have seen Ken Burns' recent um, PBS special on the American buffalo. Uh, it's fascinating. And just the photographs and the pictures in that in that um, PBS special to show you just, they were so incredibly numerous, but the Rocky Mountain locust, which was a numerous locust species that inhabited the North American continent, its biomass actually came close to approaching um, that of the bison, 8.5 million tons versus 11 million tons, not much of a, of a difference there. And by the way, that Rocky Mountain locust, which was so numerous, has been extinct for more than a hundred years, which is a crazy thing to think about. And I always show people because I love, love this book. <laughs> and I always keep it here by my desk. But the story of that is told in this really cool book called Locust by Jeff Lockwood, who was a grasshopper biologist and, and is a really amazing writer. Pick it up for Christmas for somebody. So, Outbreaks or high densities get a lot of attention uh, when we talk about grasshoppers or women crickets, but we're still really learning why, how, and where they happen. There's a lot that we still don't know, but they commonly occur at different locations from year to year, but some locations do appear to be more susceptible than others. Weather does seem to play a role, and accumulated temperature over a season uh, can influence development time and make... Um, make these a little bit more common or more, more, more likely when there's a lot of hot days um, and that allows the grasshoppers to develop more quickly. Rainfall timing might be important, but density alone, which is um, something that we think about when we think about outbreaks is really not the only predictor of damage. High densities can be accommodated if the forage base is in good shape. There's predators, a lot of predators, and I'm gonna be talking about that a lot today, but predators can be important for keeping a cap on grasshopper populations in most years. In Idaho, and, and I just 
I should say that when I talk tonight, I'm not only going to be talking about Idaho, but where I can, I've brought in a little bit of Idaho information. Um, ecological disturbance, especially shrub loss and conversion to annual grasslands is associated with increased densities. I have this laser pointer here and that's what that little red thing that you're seeing. So I, I'm going to be using that later, but um, if that's bothering you, sorry about that. So, you know, I, I mentioned that we have a long history um, of a human experience with, with grasshoppers and locusts and crickets, like Mormon crickets. And people have dealt with outbreaks in myriad ways since the beginning of time. But our primary method these days involves spreading insecticide over the land. APHIS, which is an agency under the US Department of Agriculture has the authority to control and suppress grasshoppers and women crickets under the Plant Protection Act, which is a federal law. The federal government has had this authority since the 1930s. Now APHIS only has authority to spread insecticides over rangelands. These are areas where livestock are allowed to graze or range. And as the two photos show, rangelands are widely variable native grasslands and shrublands. They cover a huge part of the American West. They can be dominated by different plant associations as you can see in these photos. APHIS does not have the authority to treat croplands except if it's a minor component of a rangeland treatment. And I find this really interesting as well because until the 1950s, the concern was to protect crops from grasshopper damage which makes sense because croplands are areas of greater investment and economic value. Now, most of the land that receives the treatments or applications, the insecticide applications is federal land managed by the Bureau of Land Management, something that many people are surprised to learn. Of course, these are multiple use lands um, that are there to provide conservation benefits, recreation, scientific value on an equal footing with grazing and other economic uses. So I talked about 25,000 species of Orthoptera around the world. Uh, we don't even have you know, a fraction of that, which is again, kind of amazing because we think about the West as being real grasshopper land, but we have about 400 species on the Western rangelands um, in, in America. Now we're conditioned to think about grasshopper, and I'm, when I say grasshoppers, just FYI, I, I use that term kind of loosely to encompass grasshoppers and Mormon crickets, but so you might hear me say grasshoppers and you'll be like, is she talking about crickets too? It's, usually I'm, I'm talking as a group, but there will be times I will be specifically talking about one or another. So we're conditioned to think about grasshoppers as pests, but is that the full story? In fact, most grasshoppers living in the American Western rangelands never increase dramatically in population. The dozen or so that do, such as the two shown here, which is the migratory grasshopper up here, and the Mormon cricket down here, um, they only rise in population under some conditions. So there are numerous non-damaging species that coexist with the pest species. And some grasshopper ecologists have suggested that they, these non-damaging species can help to keep damaging species in check through competition. When control programs are undertaken, these non-damaging species are also hurt. And as one grasshopper ecologist put it, the overwhelming majority of grasshoppers killed in control programs are not causing the problem and may be beneficial. Now the size of treatments, uh, the areas that are sprayed uh, varies, but sometimes they're enormous. For example, in 2021, APHIS planned to spray insecticides across a footprint of 2.6 million acres in Montana and in just two counties of Montana, Powder River County and Custer County, there was a footprint planned of 1.2 million acres. This is more than the area of Rhode Island, which is a little state, but still. Now, APHIS applies the insecticide when they use an aerial spray, um, typically in a what I call like a zebra pattern. They skip every other swath. Usually it's about 100 feet. So some people would say, oh, it's only sprayed over half that acreage. But we have to think about drift, APHIS's estimated drift, and there's been at least one state pesticide investigation, and it shows that the pesticide drifts a lot farther than 100 feet. So we look at the whole footprint area, 
And we end up wondering, you know, how are the insects that are not the targeted spray going to get away when these, when these spray areas are so large? We've also seen that sometimes these spray areas include sensitive lands, including wilderness study areas, which are supposed to be managed to preserve the wilderness character under BLM policy. In the past, we've also seen treatments occasionally in sensitive areas like national wildlife refuges, which also are supposed to be managed for wildlife first. In New Mexico this last summer, the federal government released a request for quote, for spraying a neurotoxic insecticide carbaryl, which is one of the, one of the four uh, insecticides in the toolbox. It's considered a likely human carcinogen. Then this spray was going to cover 39 square miles of Northern New Mexico to kill native grasshoppers. The spray um, inc included a wilderness study area. It was adjacent to the Rio Shama, which is a beloved recreation site and a source for drinking water for the city of Albuquerque. So not only are we concerned about the fact that sensitive areas are included, that oftentimes areas are large, but we don't see site-specific analysis of these in the environmental documents that APHIS includes, which would alert the public about what's going on, where it's gonna happen and allow people to weigh in on particular values. So I'm gonna talk about birds now. As an Audubon audience, you know birds and you also know how they require a lot of food in order to fly and keep warm. On average, I've seen estimates of about 25 to 50% of their body weight they need to consume every day. So it should come as no surprise to see that dozens of different birds utilize grasshoppers as food, an abundant, highly nutritious resource right there in their midst. In fact, more than 200 birds have been recorded consuming grasshoppers in North America. And early ornithologists explored and documented life histories of birds. And one way in which they did this is they would dissect the digestive systems of the birds and figure out what was inside. So this list cat was put together by an entomologist at Utah State University uh, together with another guy, I don't quite remember where he was from, um, showing the birds found with grass, the birds that were found with grasshoppers or crickets in their digestive tracts. And I've put in bold and large font the ones that had consumed a particularly striking number of orthoptera. So just to look at this a little bit, as in I've, I've been talking, I'm sure you have, but notice the diversity. We've got everything from wading birds to hawks to uh, other, uh, you know, gulls and um, shorebirds. We've got a uh, burrowing owl. We've got some wood, a woodpecker. Um, and then we've got swallows, you know, magpies and ravens. And, you know, then we, we go to all these passerines, different passerines, including the sparrows and finches and so on, blackbirds. Here's a similar list that uh, is specific to birds noted preying on Mormon crickets. And this one was um, put together by a Nevada entomologist from the University of Nevada, Ira LaRivers. He based this list on observations and some dissections. Again, I used bold and large font to indicate the birds in, that either he had observed consuming a ton or that he found with a lot of them in their digestive systems. Oh, and I did I say that he based this on both dissections and observations? So just how many grasshoppers can some of these birds consume? I'm going to spend a few minutes looking at a few different examples of birds. But I want to preface that by saying that it's worth remembering that insects are important in the diet of most bird species, especially during the breeding period. And they're especially critical food for many juvenile birds. So looking at the Western Meadowlark, which is one of my favorites, because they're so incredibly beautiful, <laughs> um, this bird can consume 78,500 grasshoppers per square mile. This is an estimate based upon uh, the observations that these early, early ornithologists and later ornithologists uh, made. Look, now La Rivers, with who I mentioned in the last slide, he, he wrote some interesting things and it's kind of fun to look at historical writings or writings from people that came before us and they, they wrote so well, but so I wanna read this. This species is by far the ablest avian predator of the Mormon cricket. 
Food specializes upon the eggs of the pest. Meadowlarks have been reported at various times as destroying entire vast cricket egg beds. And I have on many occasions seen them hard at work in such egg beds, digging industriously for the palatable eggs, which are generally laid in clusters of from a few to over 50. So uh, grasshoppers can comprise 96% of their diet when uh, populations are high. And we did see a study where meadowlarks actually declined significantly between 10 and 21 days after applications and treatment areas. So this is one example. The California gull, this species is justly famous for ending an attack by, well, I'll, I'll hear I use the word because it's sort of like subconscious, like I said, but early Mormon uh, LDS settlers in Utah experienced a Mormon cricket uh, attack on their first crops. And so I'm gonna take the time to, to read this quote by the Mormon pioneer leader, Orson Whitney, as it's so evocative. When it seemed that nothing could stay the devastation, great flocks of gulls appeared, filling the air with their white wings and plaintive cries and settled down upon the half ruined fields. All day long, they gorged themselves and when full, disgorged and feasted again, the white gulls upon the black crickets, like hosts of heaven and hell contending until the pests were vanquished and the people were saved. Wow. I mean, that is enough to make me go to church. But anyway, <laughs> there's also evidence that this species um, can be enormously helpful from other studies and observations. Knowlton, who is one of those entomologists that I mentioned earlier, in 1941, he documented huge aggregations of California gulls on Utah alfalfa fields. And farmers estimated they cleaned up 90% of the grasshoppers and they were also eating crickets. Uh, another entomologist uh, in 1952 dissected 529 stomachs over several years and seasons. And he found that grasshoppers were more than 50% of the items um, and most of what was found in June and July. In fact, Oh, this is, I have to take this off. Well, I had a click here. I get this. There we go. <laughs> a single California gull collected from an Alberta pasture contained 535 large two-striped grasshoppers. So you can see the capacity of this bird species to consume so many grasshoppers, um, huge numbers. So what about the hawks? We saw quite a few of those on that earlier um, two sets of slides. Um, looking at the Swainson's hawks, which gather in pre-migratory flocks um, from mid-June to late August, um, ornithologists have, fig have figured out that each bird eats at least 100 grasshoppers per day. And a Utah study found as many as 68 grasshoppers per stomach. And then there's the beautiful American kestrel, another favorite of mine. Um, and in, in a study about their food consumption, orthopterans, again, Mormon, uh, excuse me, uh, grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids, um, comprised a large proportion of their kestrel diet and up to 60%. And for nestlings, orthopterans were even more important, up to 72%. Another gull, the Franklins, has been documented with really an astounding number of grasshoppers or crickets in its bellies. Again, I'm gonna read from the account of this early naturalist. From the stomach of a Franklin's gull, there were taken 70 entire grasshoppers and the jaws of 56 more. From another, 90 grasshoppers and 102 additional jaws. From another, 48 grasshoppers and 70 more jaws and still another contains 67 grasshoppers. Another stomach of this species contains 68 crickets. These grasshoppers and crickets were each more than one inch in length. Again, astounding, shows the capacity of some of these birds to consume these, these orthopterans. Now, it's not just the gulls, hawks, and falcons. Um, a number of studies have looked at the grasshopper consumption of various little brown jobs, right? The various sparrows and other widespread breeding birds in the West. 
And while breeding, these birds are also heavy consumers of grasshoppers. For example, grasshopper sparrow has been, grasshoppers have been found under studies to comprise between 14 and 78% of their diet. Vesper sparrow, grasshoppers with 68% of the nestling food. Horned lark, the parrot consumes 156 grasshoppers per day, along with 705 other insects. Wow. Uh, lark bunting, 65 grasshoppers per day per bird, along with several hundred other insects. Grasshoppers comprise 48% of the diet, even while making up only 10% of the available prey. And we do see this sometimes with certain birds that seem to key in a little bit more on grasshoppers. So given all this, some have asked, does bird predation reduce grasshopper density? And the answer is yes. Researchers who um, studied this used exclosures to study grasshopper densities, basically excluding birds from an area so that they could see how many grasshoppers were in that area that basically, you know, without the, the, the effect of predation. And then they compared areas that were not excluded. So they found that um, birds reduced grasshopper densities by significant amounts, and this ranged from 26% up to 80% with the amount varying by the study. Now the effect of avian predation on grasshopper density appears to be more pronounced when grasshopper densities are lower. This can be interpreted to mean that birds on their own don't stop an outbreak. But what we don't know, because birds have always coexisted with orthopterans, is the question, would outbreaks be worse if birds were not around playing their role as predators? In other words, do birds help prevent outbreaks from being more severe or more frequent just by being out there on the landscape? So I've looked at a lot of basic dietary observations and then we looked at what happens when birds are excluded. Um, what if we tried to estimate just how many grasshopper birds consume in a breeding season based on bioenergetics, or essentially the caloric needs of a bird population? Well, this has been done a couple of times. And the takeaway is that grasshopper consumption is significant. One estimate done back in the 80s and shown on the left calculated that using an average density of birds um, out there on the landscape and what was considered to be a reasonable amount of grasshopper consumption per bird per day, that uh, out on the landscape, grasshopper uh, birds would consume more than 6.5 million grasshoppers per square mile. Now, this is a potential underestimate because they did not consider nestling consumption. So another uh, scientist took this on and looked at it in a little bit more of a detailed model um, they looked at a model sparrow and figured out what they ate and, um, you know, in, in dry weight, five kilograms per arthropods per family unit per breeding season. They took the percentage of that that were grasshoppers and the weight of the grasshoppers and the number of family units, the density out there. And basically they calculated that birds out there on the landscape, you know, these little sparrows can, and, you know, songbirds, the passerines, can consume more than 56 million grasshoppers per square mile, which is significantly larger than the other. However, this may be a potential overestimate it's because many pairs don't pull off two successful birds per season and the percent of grasshopper consumption um, might be higher than the average. It's worth comparing these though with the economic threshold of grasshoppers used by APHIS, which is eight adults per square yard, which converts into 25 million grasshoppers per square mile. So you can see that uh, if it's somewhere in the middle between 6.5 million and 56 million, you know, this is a significant number of grasshoppers that approaches the economic threshold that's actually consumed by birds if we have them out on the landscape. So I presented a lot of information about the importance of grasshoppers and crickets to a wide variety of birds, but it's really not just about the grasshoppers, the orthoptera. Most of the birds I've mentioned um, also rely on other kinds of insects, such as beetles and butterfly caterpillars. For example, researchers that looked across the nestling diets of grassland and shrubland passerines, songbirds, um, found that uh, 
basically grasshoppers and crickets comprised about 29% of the dietary biomass. Beetles were about 24% of, the, of their diet and butterflies and moths about 23%. This is all in biomass. And a study that was specific uh, to a couple of birds and that was done in Idaho, the sage sparrows or sagebrush sparrows and brewery sparrow found that lepidopterans were 18 and 24% of the nestling diet. So we can see that it's, again, it's not just about the grasshoppers, it's about insect food out there on the landscape. And this is illustrated by looking at the greater sage grouse. There's a lot of detail on this slide. Um, there's been a lot of studies on this bird, but the takeaway is that insect food is essential to the chicks who will actually die if deprived of insects. And many studies have identified grasshoppers and in some cases, Mormon crickets specifically as important food. Sometimes orthopterans comprise the highest proportion of insects in the diet, but sage grouse also rely on other insects, ants, beetles, and again, caterpillars are also important components of sage grouse chick diets. I'm not gonna go into all the detail, but that's sort of like what this says if you were to look at it more closely. So with all that, let's go back and think about this rangeland pesticides program that APHIS uses to kill grasshoppers and worm and crickets. Um, on this slide, I highlight three of the chemicals used by APHIS, but they, they actually use four. Um, diflubenzron, carbidol, and chlorantranolipril each have a little blurb here, but they also use malathion, although malathion is used very rarely these days, it seems. Um, it was used heavily in the past, though. So all of these chemicals are used because they've been proven to work well on grasshoppers and worm and crickets, and APHIS has used um, malathion, diflubenzeron, and car carbaryl for quite some time. Chlorantranolipril is new. I don't think it's been used yet, but I, I don't really know for sure for reasons I'll talk about later. A few highlights about each of these chemicals, starting with diflubenzeron. Diflubenzeron on the left there is currently the, the most frequently used pesticide by APHIS. The way it works is that it basically interferes with the formation of the insect or arthropod exoskeleton. This would be like, well, if you recall insect biology, they go through a larval stage. Usually there's several larval stages and to grow because they, they don't have bones inside like we do, they have to shed their exoskeleton in order to get bigger. Well, this chemical interferes with that. So they can't move from one instar to another, basically one developmental size to another when they're, when they're juveniles or larvae. So that's how that chemical works. Um, diflubenzeron is fairly persistent. It can stick to terrestrial vegetation for weeks. Um, and a study found bumblebee reproduction suppressed at very, very low rates in the lab. Let's look at carbol for a minute. It's highly toxic to a wide range of wildlife. Um, EPA considers it a likely human carcinogen. Um, it's often applied as a bait, um, particularly in some of the shrub step lands. And chlorantranolipril, as I said, it's new. Um, it works on both adults and um, larvae or juveniles, as does carbol, by the way. Um, Chlorantranolipril, it's possible that the juveniles or larvae may be more sensitive than adults. It is very persistent um, in some of the study, uh, the you know, the most persistent, it could take up to three years for environmental residues to be cut in half. A lot depends upon soil type, pH, stuff like that, but it is very persistent. It's also known to be exceptionally effective at killing butterfly and moth caterpillars, which as we've just seen, are foods that are very important to birds. So those are a few highlights. Um, the takeaway is that Xerces does have concerns about the impacts of each of these chemicals to the insect ecology. And that's because each of these is not toxic solely to grasshoppers and can stick around, you know, some of them can stick around for quite a while. Let's talk about some examples of the effects of some of the different chemicals that APHIS uses. Um, for malathion, I'm gonna focus here just on some effects to birds. Um, 
by the way, historic records exist of birds being directly killed by grasshopper insecticide applications made for grasshopper control um, in the 50s and 60s. Um, there were stronger chemicals used back then. And APHIS, thank God, has transitioned away from the worst chemicals that they used back in the 50s and 60s. But malathion, it was used pretty heavily after that. It's still available, as I said. And it is associated with a variety of negative effects on birds, ranging from blue sparrow and sage thrasher to uh, greater sage grouse. West, uh, effects varied by study, but included smaller nestling sizes, lower number of fledglings, uh, lower survivorship trend, reduced brood sizes. And for Western meadowlark, it's a little bit harder to tease out. I included this in here because in this study, by uh, George and colleagues back in the 90s, meadowlarks on treated plots consistently decreased at 10 and 21 days post-treatment. Now they don't know if the birds were leaving the area because they couldn't find food or if there was some uh, direct uh, impact to the meadowlarks themselves. But they did have to group all the treatments and looking at this because the sample size for each, they were testing four different treatments, one of them being malathion, and this, the sample size wasn't big enough to really test um, the individual effects. But when they looked at whether an area was simply treated with something or not, this is an effect that they, they found on meadowlarks. So um, diflubenzaron field studies, we, fee, we see effects to a variety of insects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the most used pesticide. And on this slide, I've summarized five field studies that examine diflubenzaron effects to insects beyond grasshoppers. Um, I'm going to take a little time with this slide, which is a little bit more complex. I'm not meaning to overwhelm you, but um, to orient you, the columns show um, the author, the, the length of the study, spray area, short-term effects, effect after one year and study limitations. So um, I, I wanna look at these with you so that you can kind of take in all the information that's on this slide. So um, all of these studies, well, first of all, let's look at the length of the study. Um, all of these studies looked at effects for a few weeks after the spray. Time periods ranged um, from three weeks up to about 10 weeks in the, in the period immediately following the spray, depending upon the study. Oh, up to several months in this one, actually. Most didn't look to see if there was an effect detectable the following year, but, but two of them did. I, I, you know, two out of the five did. Now the spray area sizes here were quite small in three of the studies, only 40 acres. Um, this study down here was done on a very different kind of design than what we see used um, in the US. It was looking at like these 50 meter wide strips and then separated very widely um, before you got to the next strip, like, I don't know, half a kilometer or something, something big. Um, this is the one study that looked at what we would consider to be a typical aerial spray because APHIS uses aerial spray only on a minimum of 10,000 acres. So this study looked at spray areas that um, were ranging between three spray areas ranging between about 10 and 30,000 acres. So we can see that there's some difference in the sizes. What about short-term effects to insects other than grasshoppers? Well, all of them did find short-term effects. Um, there's, there's everything from reduced ants and flying predators up here between 43 and 59% to reduced parasitoids. Parasitoids are insects that basically par par um, use parasitism to mess with another insect and usually kill them in that way. So they're important natural enemies. Reduced <coughs> bees, bees, wasps, flies, and spiders here. Um, this study also found that this one was a little different. It actually found that flies were higher um, after the spraying, but there were fewer spiders. This one had reduced ants, and this study found reduced butterfly and moth caterpillars and remained low for several months. So um, 
one, so moving to the next column, what about the long-term effects? Remember, diflubenzeron interferes with the developing eggs and juveniles. It doesn't kill adults. And some insects, notably a lot of bees, produce only one generation a year. So considering that if this generation is impacted, or if any part of that generation is impacted, the effect won't show up until the following year in a reduced population size. So short-term studies really don't tell us the full story of the, what the impact might be for species that only produce one generation per year. But as you can see here, the studies of long-term effects have been really sparse, which is a problem. Of the ones shown here, only two um, looked at that, and they only did one sampling a year later. Um, one of these studies showed no effect. Um, but notice that in this study, the treated areas were really tiny, only 40 acres. And those could have been recolonized from the edges pretty readily. Now, the other long-term study, which looked at the big spray areas, did find effects and found them to a wide variety of insects, including beetles, bees and wasps, um, and flies. Interestingly, this is the only study that looked at real-world large-scale spray areas, which is what APHIS typically does in practice. All of these studies had limitations, so none of them should be looked at alone, but many were tiny. I've already mentioned that that is a problem because it limits the power to tell us about what happens in the real world. Um, on a small spread area, insect populations might not show many effects even rapidly after, right after, because again, small areas can be quickly recolonized. There were issues with some of the studies, uh, other studies such as the sampling methodology or the amount of unsprayed area being quite a bit more than used now. That was um, one of the issues in this study um, or a spray design very different from what we use here. So there was no perfect study, but nonetheless, there's a pattern. These studies suggest that both short and long-term impacts do occur and suggests that more species groups are affected for large treatment areas. I've seen APHIS dismiss these effects in their environmental documents saying they're not significant, but it's worth recognizing the breadth of the impacts to different groups of insects. Um, even short-term effects to a wider range of species could be harmful if they coincide with the time period that birds and other wildlife most need insect food, because as we've seen, a lot of these birds rely on of several different kinds of insects. Let's look at carbaryl, specifically bait. There have been a few studies on carbaryl bait, and, and these were a little bit more ambitious in terms of study area. They, um, these were not 40 acre um, treatment areas. Um, one was the, on the left, a 5,100 acre treatment. Um, this was a, about a 3,500 acre treatment in this one as well. Um, each of these studies showed effects to beetles, in some cases, fairly dramatic effects short term, and one showed an effect um, at, after a year later, this one. Um, however, in each of these studies, the rate that they used was higher than the rate used by APHIS today. Unfortunately, we couldn't find field studies to assess the effects on beetles at the current rates of carbaryl bait that's used, but we can't assume a linear decrease. In toxicology, things are not always linear. A lot of times there's S-curves. So without the data, we really don't know if there might still be an effect. There may be, but we just don't know the magnitude. So we view this carbaryl bait uh, with caution, especially when it comes to beetles. Now, I've talked a lot about these different, you know, bird food, what the effects might be, um, and thinking about how that might affect birds, but I kind of want to broaden it for a second because it's really our concern. It's not only about the effect to bird food. Um, birds are not the only ones that enjoy munching down on grasshoppers. There's also mammals, reptiles, amphibians, etc., cetera, uh, fish. But so a lot of animals out there in the landscape make a living off grasshoppers, including some that go directly for the eggs, which is really the most effective natural suppression we can get when you think about it. So um, this was a really interesting study because these scientists found that an average of 18% of grasshopper egg pods were destroyed annually by the larvae 
of invertebrate predators, primarily um, including bee flies, which is shown here on the left, ground beetles, and blister beetles, not shown here. Um, so when we look at the impact of applying pesticides to kill grasshoppers and worm and crickets, we also need to think beyond food for birds and remember the insect and spider natural enemies, the predators and parasitoids of grasshoppers and crickets that perform that natural pest control themselves. Um, if we hurt the base of natural enemies, there's a risk of actually exacerbating the problem. And some scientists have presented evidence that um, that exact thing, harming natural enemies, has, a, has caused grasshopper outbreaks to be more likely and longer where control efforts were particularly aggressive. So finally, I wanna talk about transparency or unfortunately the, the lack of it in the APHIS program. Considering that these treatments are more often than not occurring on public land, where conservation and recreation are also priorities, you would think or hope that APHIS would exhibit a lot of transparency before those planes go into the air, such as sharing detailed survey information. What are they actually finding out there when they go out and they do their nymph surveys? showing maps of proposed treatments so the public can be aware. Again, there's a lot of people out there on the land and a lot of people who care about other things. And completed treatments, you think we would see those and reaching out to get the input of a variety of stakeholders when they're, they're really thinking about putting a spray into a particular area. But unfortunately, it seems like the opposite occurs. Only Oregon shows detailed survey information, unfortunately. Out of 17 states that could have grasshopper control programs, we only see survey information in advance by the state of Oregon. There are neither planned nor completed treatments um, that we can find ever posted at the APHIS website. What we've learned, we found out about through the contracting website mostly, which is not exactly a public friendly site and nobody's going to think about going there unless you're really, really interested and know about it. Um, and it's also not clear um, why such large treatment areas are delineated because again, when we do see survey information, they don't always seem to reflect uh, where the high densities have actually been found. So we think that when we're talking about spreading insecticides over public lands, we deserve to have a broader discussion with the stakeholders, the broad set of stakeholders that are out there, which extend beyond livestock interests. It also includes uh, organic farmers, it includes conservation organization, recre recreation interests, and so on, and people who make their living in other ways. So ultimately, our point is that we share the land with birds and insects, and we need them. We need them both. And we are you know, hearing studies that show that grassland birds are significantly down compared to decades ago. And while I'm certainly not going to say that this program has caused that, we don't think that it's helped. And many studies also show insecticides declining in many parts of the world. And like birds, they're under threat from a variety of causes. But again, there's no question that this program represents yet another stressor. So at the scale and the frequency that this program operates at, we, we have concerns. Um, spreading toxic chemicals around is just a very short-sighted way to resolve our conflict with a cyclical process that has operated for millennia and millennia and millennia. So what would we like to see instead? I mean, I think I'd, you know, it's good to talk about that now because I, I know that this has been a fairly pointed critique and I know that there are people here who might not be happy with that, but what we would like to see is that we'd like to see that the land managers and APHIS work together to promote ecologically sound rangeland strategies that maintain ecosystem productivity, that conserve natural enemies and the natural processes that support them, and that minimize the size of treated areas. Sounds easy, right? I'm sure it is not. And so it, you know, a few ideas about how to put this into practice. And I don't do land management myself anymore. Again, I don't think this is easy, but certainly it's important first to look at habitat. Can the rangeland be made less conducive to grasshoppers and worm and cricket outbreaks through heavier vegetation cover? Um, or, there are some studies about this and it's worth really investigating. This is a tall order, but it's absolutely necessary. 
Second thing is sound, well-distributed monitoring coupled with sound decision-making about whether to treat or not. This is essential. Treating may seem to be rational by using the economic threshold that APHIS has used for a long time, eight adults per square yard. But remember, that only considers one economic value, which is livestock forage. All the ecological services that I mentioned at the very beginning and that we've talked about throughout this, that grasshoppers and other insects provide, they're assigned no value at all, but certainly they do have an economic value. Oh, I, I was gonna make one more point of minimizing um, the treatment area size. Um, this is something that is also important. This can you know, help limit the risk to non-targets by keeping the, any treatment as targeted as possible. And Idaho's program currently does reduce exposure over the landscapes over the landscape which we support. Um, treatments are allowed only within one mile of cropland, which are the kind of like the deep red areas on the map. And treatments are also usually done by ground rather than aerially. So I, before we go into questions, I wanna end by saying thank you to our numerous supporters, starting with members and ending with funders, but including so many people in between like more than a hundred scientists from around the world and dozens of federal, state and local agencies and hundreds of farmers and land managers. We could not do our work without our supporters and our partners. So my heartfelt thanks. And you can join the movement too. We welcome new members every day who are making a difference for invertebrates. You can become one of our supporters by heading to our website at xerces.org slash donate. And so I wanna say again, thank you. We'll go to questions now. And um, you, if you don't feel comfortable voicing your question today, or you wanna reach out to me to talk about this more afterwards, feel free to reach out to me afterwards by email. There's my email address, sharon.salvaggio at xerces.org. So with that, um, we can go to questions. Oh, I wanted to say too, um, I've invited uh, my supervisor, Ame Code, who's the director of our pesticide program. She's a phenomenal person and somebody who really knows this stuff um, and has been so helpful to me as we've tried to piece, piece together you know, what this all means. Um, so Ame and I are gonna be both here to answer your questions tonight. Excellent, excellent. Okay, take a, take a, deep, um, take a deep breath. Um, and um, let me get uh, you guys up here. Uh, where did you go, Sharon? Oh, do you not see me? You're still visible, but I think there's just still a lot. And there's a bunch of great questions. Oh. All right. Okay. So let me... Um, if you can find her um, pin her, okay, Ma. Um, so, so there was a few different questions uh, early on when you in your research or you were talking about research results about the western meadow lark and that and that there were you decline in population of western meadow lark. So you remember that slide, Sharon. Mm -hmm. So people asked uh, the questions were, you know, was there fatalities um, of the western meadow lark? Did they disappear? Uh, and then also what chemicals were used that are, you know, implied in that, um, in that. Um, in that yeah. yeah, great questions. Um, my recollection um, is that they, pop they were measuring population at different times after the spray. And so the total population of Western meadowlarks disappeared and the authors interpreted that saying, well, they may have left the area because there weren't enough insects left for them to eat. Um, or it could have been for other reasons. I, I can't quite remember exactly what they discussed, but I think that they felt like it probably was because of a reduced food source. Um, the four chemicals that they were testing in that study were two different kinds of carbaryl. One was the bait, one was the liquid, malathion, and um, a biological um, pesticide, nosema, which is... Um, it's, it's a virus, right, Amé? Um, I think it's a virus, or some kind of bacteria. I can't quite remember, but 
it basically is um, something that can make animals sick, make invertebrates sick. So um, again, in that study, they didn't see effects individually with the four chemicals, but when they sort of divided, like was an area treated with something versus nothing, that's when they saw the effect on the Western meadowlarks. Thank you, Sharon. That's great. And so, uh, Amay, can you say, is that, is, is Jessica Davis, is she, is Jessica Davis, is she, I think it's a she, referring to this, to the study? That you know, I'm not certain of the study. This is the George, um, George McEwen Peterson effects of grasshopper. Is that the study? I think so. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember it was George et al. 1995, I believe. Yeah. I, yeah. That yeah. sounds right then. Okay. Nice. okay. Thanks, Jessa. Good. Thank and, you. and we'll, we'll, we can send that out, um, uh, as a follow-up too, as well. If we're interested. Sure. Okay. Um, if, uh, this is about the chemical uh, carbaryl, is that how you pronounce it? So if EPA classifies this as a carcinogen, why is it available on the shelf, you know, whatever your Home Depot as seven, S-E-V-I-N? <laughs> well, uh, I'm gonna go to Ame in a second here of, of, to help answer this because she has worked more in human health, especially early in her career than I did. But, um, the way in which pesticides are regulated, uh, we've got a lot of dangerous chemicals out there. <laughs> Just because something's on the market doesn't mean it's safe. Um, the whole process of even determining whether chemicals are carcinogenic or not isn't even finished. I mean, EPA has to look at a lot of different kinds of studies to do that. And um, so, you know, this is work in progress for them, but it doesn't mean that they, they take chemicals off the shelf, we see that with lots of different kinds of chemicals that we know that they have massive effects like the neonics, but they're still registered and available for people to use. Amay, do you wanna add? I think you basically covered, I mean, we can't speak for the regulatory agency, but the reality is, is the, the threshold for risk that EPA looks at, you know, well, one, they'd use, they, they have a cost benefit analysis. And we could argue back and forth about whether they consider all the costs and all the benefits at any given moment. But that cost benefit means that they are accepting some risk. They're expecting some risk when they put a pesticide on the market. Uh, the other thing to think about is that there is a threshold of no un of avoiding unreasonable adverse effects. So again, expecting some risk. If the probability or possibility of causing cancer is low enough and the perceived risk high enough, they're going to put something on the market. I think, you know, Sharon said it well that we do in a number of arenas have products around us that just because they're on the market doesn't mean they're safe. They can often be used. It doesn't mean the end point of concern, cancer, is going to happen to everyone who uses it, but it is a possibility. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, now, uh, this has happened to me a number of times, Sharon, and um, sorry, you have a very tough audience here, but the gull that you showed is a ring-billed gull and not a California gull. So you'll want to find a local bird expert to make sure that you have a picture of a California gull next time. Thank uh, you. And, I downloaded it off the flicker and it said it was a California gull. <laughs> I know. And I, I had, was never good with my gulls, but thank you for that. Right. They, they do look similar. And I had the same problem with a flammulated owl in our owl class last week. I'm like, oh, OK, whoops. Um, I also uh, this, 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 the recording of this program tonight will be available on the Golden Eagle Audubon Society YouTube channel. And that's G-E-A-S YouTube channel. That's the easiest way to get there. But I will send out the link to all, to everybody who was here this evening as well. Um, what role has climate change played in um, impacting a Mormon cricket, um, the, crickets and maybe increasing or decreasing, affecting the outbreaks that you spoke about? Uh, that's, that's kind of a tough one to answer. I think that people are kind of starting starting to investigate that. Um, there've been some projections. I'm not as familiar with, with that body of work, but what I re recall and just, you know, know that it's not like I read these studies recently, but, um, there is, I think, some concern that climate change is going to cause more severe and more frequent outbreaks of the pest grasshoppers that do outbreak. 
Um, but it's not consistent across all species. There's some variability there, and I, I don't remember all the reasons why, but um, something that I think we, we need to be aware of, I think when we you know, think about the program and whether we have a chance to reform the way in which the program operates, it's even more important if we think that we might have bigger concerns in the future. I think the more that we can learn to, with non-chemical means, um, help ourselves, you know, not have such bad outbreaks, um, the better off we're gonna be. I probably didn't say that very well and I may always says things better. <laughs> so I may, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey, I definitely could not have given the presentation you gave. I learned so much tonight. So don't even, no need to be humble here. Um, it's true. We, I'm a toxicologist, right? And environmental health and toxicology is my background, not climate change. With climate change, we definitely have winners and losers. Um, and some grasshoppers appear to do better under the kinds of extreme weather conditions that climate change brings. So with that caveat that this is not our arena, some some of these species might be doing better because of the drought and issues that we have with that are that are associated with climate change. Um, and as Sharon was saying a moment ago, I think it's really important as we look at the long term solutions. If we are just knocking down an annual population of grasshoppers and we're not addressing and trying to make our lands more resilient to be available to be survivable during climate change issues, we're not going to get to the long term solution. You know, so if I don't know if that made sense, see that didn't I didn't speak very clearly either, Sharon. Um, yeah, if it's okay, the, the, got it. You got the answer. Okay, there's a lot more it, questions. It sounds like it sounds like it's an excellent question and one that we should be encouraging the researchers to look into and maybe APHIS to also look into as the program mm -hmm. evolves and that it can't be based on conditions from you know the 20th century. It has to be looking forward. And, right. and looking at rangeland health, knowing that we have, you know, that climate resilience is an issue we need to be aware of. And and then, and ho hopefully that can also help with issues when there's concern with grasshoppers as well. Right. And of course, the different, different climate affects birds. And if they're already stressed out, you know, I mean, it's all, it's, they don't call it a you know, ecology for, for no reason. Um, are there opportunities for public review or comment before the pesticide applications occur in Idaho or elsewhere? Um, yes, there is um, every, well, in some states used to produce um, environmental documents that would go out to the public every year. A lot of states have moved to like a cycle that's like once every three or four years. Idaho is actually going to be open this year for public comment. They're re rethinking the program um, this year. Um, I don't know when that EA is going to come out, um, but- um, Environmental assessment. Environmental yeah. assessment, yeah. Um, feel free to get in touch with me if you want. I can certainly share it with you once it comes out. I just wanna to add to that something that's, there's a difference between public comment about an overarching program and knowing where applications might happen, right? So. Um, you mentioned the in New Mexico, the, the liquid carbaryl that was potentially going to be sprayed. There was an EA that came out, but it never mentioned Rio Chama, 25,000 acres, you know, and, and in that watershed. It was an overarching kind of in the state, we might have problems. And I think that's normally what these EAs are. They're kind of covering the bases that sprays might be happening that year, not really diving into the specific areas. And they're isn't really public comment period once we actually know on the ground where sprays might be happening. Thanks for that clarification, Amy. Um, so then we have a little bit of information that people have shared as well. Um, Travis Hitchner says uh, for the biological mentioned, if it was nosema lo locuste, it's a micro sporty, sporidian. Mm -hmm. oh, definitely know that I didn't go to biology class or chemistry class. Um, uh, thank you for sharing that, Travis. And then John Romero um, also shares that as a trained wildlife biologist, he's 
chairman of one of the uh, sage grouse local working groups and on the Idaho sage grouse task force um, that that he says that um, sage grouse heavily rely on herbaceous vegetation and infestations of Mormon crickets reduce that herbaceous vegetation and affect sage grouse populations. That's interesting. My, we were just, somebody was just asking today, well, do the sage grouse, uh, sorry, do the crickets eat the, the sage plants? And it sounds like John is saying, yes. Do you, do you, would you guys like to say anything to that? Add anything uh, to you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the diet of the sage grouse changes as they, they grow and develop. The, the juveniles are the ones that rely on insects heavily. And as they grow, they become more dependent upon sage, um, sagebrush um, until once they're adults, I think that's pretty much all they eat. And yes, we know that Mormon crickets um, seem to prefer broadleaf um, vegetation. And, um, you know, that, that, that could, you know, be an impact to um, a number of different species if the, the broadleaf vegetation is taken out by Mormon crickets. But there's a couple of things about that. You know, when we talk about broadleaf vegetation, we're mostly talking about flowering plants, right? And flowering plants actually showed up in the fossil record about 200 million years after orthopterans showed up in the fossil record, which means that they've had to live with orthopterans for 150 million years, essentially. So I, I, I believe that there's been probably enough history there, you know, that these plants have learned to adapt. I mean, I know that sounds very broad. I'm not trying to dismiss the concern, but we need to think about evolution when we think about, are we having some kind of impact on certain plants by a native insect on native plants? Uh, in my view, it's probably a lot less likely that that's a, a big concern than it is like introducing uh, a foreign element, which really a pesticide is. So, um, that is something you know that I think about when it comes to the effect on on flowering plants by Mormon crickets. Ame, do you want to add anything? Well, two other thoughts. I think that um, I guess one is that we also are dealing with diminishing resources, right? And so everyone's kind of feeling scarcity, and that's enough. And so we don't want to just point fingers like it's your problem, it's this problem, it's that problem. It's a it's a big problem and all of these pieces are at play. And that's why we need to be kind of looking at that big picture. I think Liz, you said it really well. That's why they call it ecology. You know, this is what ecology is, right? This It's not complex or it is complex. Um, yeah, I think that's the main point I wanted to add. But I- All right, so so open up the chat yourself. There's some other comments and um, there we have many people on this in this program tonight that are quite knowledgeable about this. And we are very grateful for the information and ideas and thoughts that they're sharing. And there's also um, a, a BLM contact there if people are interested in um, contacting the BLM with their questions about this. Um, but let's give it up for Sharon. That was an incredible presentation. I do feel like I was in chemistry class or something. And, but it, 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 I'm so appreciative that you trusted us you know, to give us the full, you know, all those, all those details. I think that makes us all much better um, uh, participants in these public processes. So thank you very much, Sharon. And thank you very much, Ame, for also helping out um, on this program this evening and to the Xerces Society for uh, having these great staff people that could come and give our program for us tonight. Again, uh, we would appreciate your year in support for Golden Eagle Audubon Society, uh, your support that makes uh, if possible for us to bring these programs to you. And um, Sharon, do you have a final word that you would like to say before I um, close our program? We've got a lot of nice uh, comments coming in. Well, again, Liz, thank you so much for having us. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Um, and as I said in the beginning, you know, um, my, my intention really is to get people to think a little bit more deeply about the role that grasshoppers and women crickets play in, our, in the ecology of Western rangelands. And I know that they can be a problem when people are having to deal with them on their own farm. Um, and I have sympathy for that. And I, and I also feel that it's really important that we, we, we think about them in the, the broad way that they really 
exist out there on the landscape. So thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to have been here and had all these great people show up. Thanks. Excellent. Oh, and let me say that if you haven't already read Sharon's blog, if you go to the Golden Eagle blog on our website, there's a nice blog that she wrote that um, contains even a little bit of different information than what she presented tonight. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I hope I see you at our program in person in January and uh, have a great holiday season. Thank you very much.